welcome grade 12s. In today's lesson, we're going to be looking at chemical industries, that section you really love to hate. One of those sections that you're really going to get, it's such an important part of your chemistry. I really like the way it's been put into your curriculum because we're putting your science into action. Now, we're trying to give you an idea of where's the, where do you use electrochemical cells? Where do you use redox reactions? Where do we, how do we get the stuff we use, where does it come from? Because we tend to think it all just drops out of the sky and there it is. Now remember that your chemical industries is actually broken down into a couple of sections. The first one is your chloroalkali industry, which is obviously the production of chlorine, hydrogen, sodium hydroxide. Your second one is your fertilizer industry, within which there are three industrial processes, Harbor, Oswald, and Contact. And then the last one is your batteries. Now, when it comes to studying this section, what I would do, grade 12s, is I would take your chloroalkali industry and your batteries and put it right when you're studying it and put it right after when you've studied electrochemical cells because it's all part of that. The electrolytic cell, it's the same redox reactions. It all works in conjunction with that, okay? And then put the nitrogen and your phosphor, um, potassium and that sort of thing at the end, okay? Because that's a different section. You are going to get one of these. Batteries you're probably going to get on its own, but in terms of chloroalkali, fertilizers, that sort of stuff, you're going to get them. Within the chloroalkali, sometimes they will add the um, production of aluminium, the smelting of aluminium, because that's important for us. We do that in Richards Bay. So you need to keep with us, okay? Now, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at a couple of uh, um, questions from 2011. We've taken them from the November paper and from the March paper from 2011. They're really nice questions. We're going to do one section at a time, so hopefully you'll follow with me, okay? So let's start with the first one. Here we go, it's from November 2011, paper 2, chemistry paper, question 10. Says to you, the simplified diagram of a membrane cell, the membrane part is quite important because remember we have three types of cells in the chloroalkali industry. We have the membrane cell, the diaphragm cell, and the mercury cell. The membrane cell is the most important one as such because most, in fact, Every company in the world should be using it if they need to do um, chloroalkali, though, not, though they're not all doing it. Mercury cell is a nice, it's slightly different in the way it works. It's, n it's nice chemistry, but we don't use it because of the mercury, because we know it's a heavy metal and it's bad for the environment. And then the diaphragm cell, very similar to the membrane cell, but it uses asbestos. And that's the biggest issue with the diaphragm cells. It uses that asbestos, and asbestos is very toxic, which we know, because we no longer can use it as insulation in, ro in rooms and houses. And miners and stuff who deal with a lot of asbestos end up with a hideous disease called asbestosis, which is very similar to deep, um, TB, and oh, it's very painful, and it's a very nasty, nasty disease. Okay, so we have the simplified version of the membrane cells used in the chloroalkali industry, and then they say to us, gas A, okay, so there's gas A, gas B, and compound C, which is over here, are formed during this process, X and Y represent the two electrodes. So now let's look at what they've given us. Okay, so water's going in. Now this is, we're going to decide how, what we're getting where. Water's going in, this is brine, and we go, remember brine means NaCaCl solution. Okay, that's like seawater, salt water, that's what brine is. And then we get the used salt solution. First of all, we're going to have to decide which gas is where, but let's now remember that compound C is the only one we take out as a liquid, and that would be sodium hydroxide. We have three products in the chloroalkali industry, and particularly in this one, sodium hydroxide, hydrogen gas, chlorine gas, okay? So this would be the sodium hydroxide that comes out. Now we've got to decide which of these gases would be which. Well, gas A cannot be the chlorine gas because then there's no hydrogen for the sodium hydroxide. So gas A is hydrogen, gas B is chlorine, okay? That means for us, if we look at this, we go, okay, remember Na, brine is Na plus Cl minus, okay? The Na plus ions are going to move towards the negative, and the Cl minus ions are going to be here, 
So they're going to move towards the positive. The Cl minus ions lose electrodes. Um, lose electrodes, lose electrons. That means this is oxidation happening here. This is the anode. And that's going to be the cathode. Okay, so let's see. Write down the function of the membrane in this cell. The membrane has two functions. First function, yeah, not so important, but its first function is to keep the two parts of the cell apart. So that helps us in terms of the taking off the sodium hydroxide. But its biggest function is to allow the Na plus ions to move from one side of the cell to the other and only allows the positive ions to move, okay? So your Na plus moves from the anode to the cathode. So when we write down the function, okay, its function is to allow Na plus ions to migrate, it's a nice big fancy word for move, to the cathode, but not the Cl minus ions. Okay, that's very important. It's what we call a semi-permeable membrane. It only allows ions to move in one direction. Okay, hopefully you guys are okay with that. Next one. Which electrode, X or Y, is connected to the positive terminal of the cell? of the supply. Well, let's see what we wrote down, okay. Now, right at the beginning, before we even looked at the question, we went, okay, remember I wrote there that that's positive and that's negative? Remember how we worked it out? Because I knew where the sodium hydroxide would end up. So the Y part is connected to the positive part of the cell, okay. How do I know that? Because the chloride ions, the negative chloride ions are attracted to the Y electrode, okay? If they, if they were attracted to the X electrode, then there would be a problem because then they would be moving through the membrane and not the sodium. So that's a real issue for us, okay? So that's why, because the Cl minus ions are attracted to the positive electrode. Okay. So they are attracted to Y. We okay with that? Good. Let's go on to the next part. Next question. Write down the name, brilliant, or formula of gas A. Now we're going to do both. You need to make a decision. It doesn't matter. Now earlier on we wrote all over it, but we just I'm just going to remind you. We said that was H2. We said that was Cl2 and that was in a OH. So guys, we've actually answered the question without actually having to do the question. Do you see what we've done? We've tried to make it, and this is, this is what I'm trying to show you, is that you don't, I would rather you wrote all over your question paper and then get to this point where we go, oh wait, I've answered that already, and just go and look it up. Then have to now sit and go, okay, wait, which one did I, because you get yourself all confused. All right, so gas A we said was, hydrogen, so that's its name, it's hydrogen gas, or H2, okay? Gas B, we've already said was chlorine, that was nice and easy. Or Cl2, and compound C, remember it's important that we know how to spell this, sodium hydroxide. Ooh drop says me make sure you can spell it and I can't let's try that again hi see no R hydroxide in a whoops in a o h please be careful grade 12s this was a nice question because it gave you the option it said write down the name or formula so that's great. So if you write either, we'll mark it, and it doesn't matter which one you write first. However, if, for example, they had said write down the formula of 
gas A. And then you write it down like I have where I put hydrogen and then put in brackets H2. You don't get the marks for that. Because hydrogen is not the formula. Hydrogen is its name. Be very, very careful with it. If they asked you to write down its name and you write its formula first and then its name, you also don't get the, on, the marks. And now you're all sitting there going, but that's not fair, I've written down the name. We know you have, but you are expecting the marker to make a decision as to which one is the correct answer, and that's not our job. We mark whatever you write first. So please be very careful. Make sure you read the question. Okay, so we've named all our things. That's brilliant. Let's go on to the next part. Oh boy, now we get to the fun part of this reaction because now it says to you, write down the balanced or net overall cell reaction taking part, place in this cell. You need to learn this one. This one is just, it's a little more complicated because now we see the NaOH and you guys want to put the NaOH in it. But remember, Sodium plus is coming from here, it's attracted to this, and it's ending up as sodium plus. The sodium is a spectator, essentially, so it mustn't be in the overall reaction, and that's what makes this really difficult for us. What's really important is what's happening with the Cl minus, because the Cl minus is changing to Cl2. And if we look at H2O, H2O comes from this, and what we're doing is we're actually taking a hydrogen off there to make the hydrogen gas, and then the OH minus ion is attach attaching itself to the Na plus. Please be careful this one. I'm going to suggest you learn this equation, okay? There's a couple of versions of it, but learn it, please. It's very, very, very important. So, first one that you can write, let's do the easy one, and this is probably the one that's easiest for all of you, is H2O plus NaCl goes to H2 plus 2NaOH plus Cl2. That's a nice easy one. We've included the spectator ion of the Na+. Plus. That's great. It's not a bad one to remember. But if they said without the spectator ions, okay, which then is the Na+, plus, this is what the reaction turns into. Because now we've got the Cl minus, I'm taking the Na plus away, gives me H2, 2OH minus, plus Cl2, okay? So the minuses are because we've taken the Na plus away from our NaCl and NaOH. Be very careful with this one you must learn the overall cell reaction. Also, make sure you spend some time looking at what is the oxidation half reaction and what is the reduction half reaction because nowhere in those reactions do you have NaOH, okay? And nowhere do you have Na+. So be very, very careful because it's actually the water and the chloride ion that's being oxidized and reduced. If they ask you that, the point here is you're gonna go, well, the chloride is losing its electrons, the chlorine is actually oxidized, okay, so this is oxidized, and the H2O is reduced. Okay, because remember what's happening here is with the H2O, you're going from, remember H2O would be the same as saying we have an H plus ion and an OH minus ion, and this H plus ion is gaining the electron from the chlorine. So it's gaining an electron to become H2. So be very careful with that one. Then, the chloroalkali industry is sometimes blamed for contributing to the greenhouse effect. Briefly explain how the above cell, above cell, that means you cannot discuss mercury, okay? You cannot discuss asbestos. You cannot discuss any of the other issues with the other two cells. It has to be with the membrane cell. Now, the membrane cell is actually environmentally the best cell to use, but it uses an incredible amount of electricity. That is how it contributes to our greenhouse gases, because 
the cell uses a lot of electricity and often if we're using carbon coal as our source as our, as our beginning power source for our electricity, we're now contributing to the greenhouse gases because that produces carbon dioxide. Do you see where we went? I know it's not the cell itself. It's the fact that the cell uses a large amount of electricity. That, that's probably its biggest downfall, is the amount of electricity that's needed. This is actually a really nice process because all your products can be used. Hydrogen, chlorine, sodium hydroxide, they are all usable. So we don't have any waste product, which is brilliant. It makes it such a nice industry. Because we use a large amount of, of um, electricity, when, now watch where we're going, when coal is burnt, to produce the electricity, okay, this leads to an increase, I'm just going to write it like that, in greenhouse gases. Okay, why? Because due to CO2 emissions, okay. Obviously, you're going to write a little bit neater than what I've done. Okay, grade 12s? Nice, nice, nice section. I promise you you're going to get some in the chloroalkali. They love it. I like it because it can, we can only really ask you this type of question. There's not too many other ways we can ask around it. Make sure you learn the equations. All right, now we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to look at the fertilizer industry, which is another very important industry. So I'm going to see you in a couple of minutes. Welcome back, grade 12s. Now we're going to go into the fertilizer industry. This is another one of those things where, unfortunately, there's stuff you're just going to have to learn. Okay, there are three chemical pro industrial processes in it Harbor, Oswald, and Contact. Harbor, you should know backwards by now. You've been doing it since grade 10. Oswald is the process where we create nitric acid and contact is the process where we create sulfuric acid, okay? Now, we're going to focus on a question that is the Oswald process. It hasn't been, hasn't come up as much as usual, but it's actually such a nice section. I love it so much. And remember, Oswald process is a, is a three-step process. It's not a single process like the Harbour process, okay? And it's like the contact process, it's got more than one step to it. So, let's look at the question. It's from the November paper again from last from 2001 and it's paper 2. Let's look at question 11. Okay, it says to us, nitric acid is used in the preparation of fertilizer. So we've got nitric acid. The flow diagram below. Love, 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 love flow diagrams. Okay, flow diagrams are becoming a very um, common way of produce of asking this sort of section grade 12s simply because we can ask a lot of theory on one little section without having to give you a lot of stuff to read which we're happy about okay we like it when we don't have to read a lot because there's less to read okay so it gives us the three steps so it says step one NH3 plus O2 and it gives us nitrogen 2 oxide so let's just quickly do the formula that means it's going to be NO then step two, we take the NO, add oxygen to it again, and we get NO2. Then we add oxygen again, and we get HNO3. Okay, so we've got the liquid. Brilliant. First question. Not much else we can do because I don't. there's no names to those particular processes. Um, so let's just see where we go, okay? First thing is name this industrial pro process in the preparation of nitric acid. We only got three names to choose from. Harbor, Oswald, or Contact. Contact is sulfuric. Harbor we know is ammonia. So that means this is the Oswald process. Okay, make sure you learn how to spell his name. It is named after the man who invented the process. And I'm a little like him. If my name gets spelled wrong, I get a bit upset. So make sure you spell his name correct. Okay, we will take spelling into account. There we go. Number two. Write the balanced equation for step B. So let's see what step B did. We've already written in the NO, so we're already halfway there. 
that's where some of the marks are going to come from, the fact that you, can, that you know nitrogen to oxide is NO. So can you see how we've helped ourselves again just by writing something in on the question paper? And we're going to add oxygen and give us NO2. Now they did say balanced equations, so let's start with just writing what we know. So it's NO plus O2, which then gives us NO2. We go, mm, problem, one nitrogen, one nitrogen. One, three oxygens, two oxygens, problem for us. So we've got an odd number of oxygens. We need rather try and change the odd number to an even number. It's the easiest way to do it. Best way to do that is let's put a two in front of the NO because now that gives me two Ns, two oxygens plus two oxygens, four oxygens. On this side, if I put a two in front of the NO2, two nitrogens, four oxygens, it's balanced, okay? Easy, easy balancing. Make sure you can balance a chemical equation in grade 12s. I'm sure you remember from stoichiometry last year in grade 11 how important it was. Balancing is one mark. Why should we throw away marks on something that's really not that difficult? And for a lot of these processes, you've got these equations balanced in your books and in your notes, I hope. Okay, so you can just learn them as they are. Then it says, NH3 reacts with O2 to form two products in step one. One of the products is nitrogen 2 oxide. What would the name, then they say write down the name of formula of the other product. Okay, so now let's just work it out and we go, well, we've got NH3 plus O2. We know it gives us NO. Now look at what's happening. And I'm going to do another color for you. Nitrogen's disappeared. One of the oxygens has been used. Uh, we've got hydrogen and oxygen, so probably we're going to get water. That's not a balanced equation by a long shot, but I didn't ask for the balanced equation. I wanted you to know what the other product was. So we get water. We can name or formula, so that means it's water. Or you could have given me H2O. Nice and easy. Alrighty. No, I skipped the question. Then, in step C, water is added to the reaction mixture. This step can be represented by the following incomplete equation. Fill in the missing reactants and balance the equation. Now look at what they gave you here. They've actually given it to you. Because they said to you NO2 plus something plus water gives me HNO3. What did they write on your flow diagram? They put oxygen there. They've given you the reaction. So you can get it straight off that, or you can just work it out. And you can go, well, this is O2, 3, hydrogen. It has to be oxygen. OK, it's one of those things where we put it in. But it's got to be balanced. So let's, let's actually balance it, because this one's quite a mean one. So we've got NO2. O2, H2O, HNO3. So now I'm going to do this. I'm going to say, OK, um, I've got one nitrogen on the left, one nitrogen on the right, two, four, five oxygens on the left. Ooh, three on the right, that's not pretty. Two hydrogens on the left one hydrogen on the right. Now, I would say to you, let's try and get rid of the uneven numbers, but because there's two uneven numbers with the oxygen, let's deal with one that's easier to start off with, okay? So let's start with balancing the hydrogens, okay? So if I put a two in front of the HNO3, this gives me a two here. That changes to a two and this changes to a six. Okay, problem. Now we go, okay, well, the nitrogen's a two now, and it was only a one on the left-hand side, so let's put a two here. So it gives me two nitrogen. And what that does is it changes my oxygens from two times two is four, plus two is six, plus one is seven. Okay, that didn't help, because now the nitrogens are balanced, but the, the, waters are, the oxygens aren't. 
So let's try change the water, the oxygens now by starting on the left hand side. Okay, let me change colors. It's starting to get a bit messy. Let me put a two in front of the H2O. Okay, because now what that does is it changes my oxygen count at the moment to eight. Okay, then that's okay. Let's see what it does. Makes hydrogens four. Mm. Okay, it's messed up hydrogen. So let's go back here. Let's change this to a four. So that means hydrogen changes to four, four nitrogens, and four times three is 12. It does get a bit messy. Sometimes you've got to go over it again. And let's then change the nitrogen, because we want this to be a four. Let's make that a four. So that becomes four nitrogens. And now we've got four times two is eight, plus two is 10, plus two is 12. Look at that. Please do not leave it looking like this in your exam. Okay, this is messy, this is horrible. Don't do it. You now go and you think about your poor marker who spent, who spent hours marking and you rewrite it and you go, that means I need four NO2 plus O2 plus two H2O, which then gives me four HNO3. And then you cross out all the stuff you don't want them to mark or you do this balancing on your question paper. Okay, that was a mean one to balance. Next one. Now it says, a 50 kilogram bag, bag of fertilizers is labeled as shown, 315 bracket 30. Calculate the mass of nitrogen present in this bag. Okay, this is my NPK number. What this number tells me is, first of all, that number tells me that 30% of the 50 kilograms is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Of that 30%, three-ninths is nitrogen, because this is a, the ratio. It's a nine-part ratio. One-ninth is phosphorus, and five-ninths is potassium. But they wanted how much nitrogen by mass. So the mass of nitrogen is going to be the 3 ninths, okay, times 30, okay. So 3 ninths times 30, so it's a third times 30, that is 10%, okay? So a third of the 30% is nitrogen. So that means, um, yeah, that means the actual mass, let's do it this way. It's, it's one of those things where you write it out and it's like, there's no set formula is 10% of 50 kilograms, so it's 10 times 0 0.1, so it's 5 kilograms. Okay, so what we need to remember here is that the 3 over 9, a third of the 30%, which is 10% of the bag, is the nitrogen. Okay, so 10% of the 50 kilograms is the nitrogen, which is 5 kilograms. There's no formula for this. There's no standard symbols your teachers might have taught you some that's great but grade 12s you've got to make sure your examiner understands what you've written okay that there's just not random numbers everywhere and you tell us what you're working out it's a new section it's one of those you know, iffy sections are probably going to get asked what we could do from here is we could now ask you questions like and we know i know you're all groaning because you're going i can hear where it's going we can ask you about eutrophication remember that if we over fertilize um, uh, crops or we put too much nutrients into our water, we cause eutrophication, which means we get a, a excess of algae growth, which means there's not enough oxygen in the water. Fish die, plants die, the algae take up all the oxygen out of the water. When the fish die, they then produce more carbon dioxide and all of that sort of thing, and it just decays and water and river systems die. It's a real problem, okay? You can rehabilitate 
rivers and lakes that have gone through eutrophication. It's just a very long process. You have to make sure you neutralize the water again. You need to make sure you get all the nonsense out of the water. And you've got to stop the source of the nitrification, wherever that nitrogen's coming from. The nitrogen can come from um, runoff from crops, from farming. If farmers over fertilize because they want a better want a better yield a crop, that doesn't actually help us very much because remember the water got and the fertilizers seep through the soil into our groundwater and eventually ends up in our rivers and lakes. So it's a real, real problem for us, okay? They love eutrophication. It's another thing you've been doing since grade 10. Make sure you understand the basics and you understand the consequences of eutrophication. So it's not just go, well, I know what it is. It's when there's excess nutrients, excess nitrates in water and you get that, that algae bloom and it goes green. You've got to understand the, the, the consequences like fish life die, aquatic life dies. We don't have clean drinking water, which means diseases and stuff grow in it. That's a real problem for us as humans, okay? So looking beyond just the animal kingdom, it's a problem for us. And it's ugly. It's absolutely horrible to look at and it breaks my heart when I see it. But we can recover it if we get it in time and we can stop the pollution, okay? So, grade 12s. We have now finished with the, new, with the um, fertilizer industry. We've done only a, short, a very small section of it. Remember, you still got to do contact and harbor process. It's in there, okay? We are going to take a short break, and when we come back, we are going to look at a electrochemical electrolytic cell, which is actually a really nice section, so I'll see you in a couple of minutes. Welcome back, grade 12s, and now we jump right into that section which you all once again groan about. Electrochemical cells, batteries, the application of electrochemical cells in redox. Such a nice section, okay? This question is taken from the February, March 2011 paper. It's paper two, it's question 10. Now it says to you, a lead acid battery or car battery consists of six cells and a battery has a capaci capacity of 20 amp hours. This whole capacity thing I know causes a bit of a headache because we're going, what does that mean? 20 amp hours means that if I had to run the battery from my car with a current of 20 amps, it would only last for one hour. Okay, straight running. Or I could run it at 20 hours, one amp. Okay, that's essentially what it means. It's how they decide on the capacity of the battery it also relates to the amount of charge which we're going to see a little bit later okay the half reactions that take place in each cell and their respective standard reduction potentials are get represented below so they give us two brilliant we've got minus 0.36 and that actually is plus 1.75 the nice thing about these cells when it comes to using car batteries and the more complicated ones is they are going to give you the half reactions that are not on your table. You do not need to learn them. You should have learned about the dry cell, okay, which essentially uses manganese dioxide inside of it, which is really important because it stops the buildup of hydrogen gas. That is a very complicated half reaction and I couldn't give it to you off my head, but it will be given to you on your in your question like this one okay because here you know the question isn't so much well can you actually remember these equations the question is can you use them can you use the tool we've given you to do stuff with it do you understand what they're telling you okay so first of all the first question are car batteries primary or secondary batteries so we've got to remember our definitions Primary batteries are batteries that have a single use only. In other words, they cannot be recharged. Secondary batteries can be recharged. So think about cars, and we're very grateful that our car batteries can be recharged. Otherwise, they would be useless, and you'd have to keep changing them every time you started your car. That would get to be expensive, and that cars would never have existed. So that tells us that car batteries are secondary batteries. Okay, so that's brilliant. We've got that one down. Next one. Okay, write down the equation for the net overall cell reaction that takes place in each of these batteries. Okay, so let's look at what we've got here. 
both of these reactions are reduction half reactions. They both have my plus two electrons on the left hand side. That becomes a bit of a problem for us because now we've got to go, okay, so which of these becomes my anode or cathode? And we've got to go, okay, anode has to be reduct has to be oxidation. So which one's oxidized? Your oxidation is always the reaction with the smallest potential. Okay? What, if it's a spontaneous reaction, and this is, the, react, the electropotential that's smallest is going to be oxidized. So it's nice with this one because this gives me a potential of minus 0, 0,36. That's definitely smaller than 1,7. But if they had given me another cell reaction and say that cell potential was 0 0.9, that 0 0.9 equation would be my oxidation half reaction because it has the smaller potential okay because it goes from small potential to high to small so your electrons will go from one end to the other that means I actually have to rewrite this equation so we go okay now I'm going to do it over here I know it's not under the equation I just want to be able to keep it with me so I can actually see it so I'm not going up and down the whole time that means I've got to turn this one around so I go PB solid but we don't need the phases, let's leave those out. PB plus HSO4 minus, which then becomes PBSO4 plus H plus two electrons. I'm going to write the other equation down anyway because I would need that in my, just because it's going to make my life easier in a second. So 3H plus plus HSO4 minus plus the two electrons goes to PBSO4 plus 2H2O. Now we've got to add these together. First thing we've got to make sure is that the electrons cancel out. So we've got electrons on both sides. So we go bye-bye, bye-bye, very happy, brilliant. Okay, let's see what else is on both sides. Um, not water, water's fine. We have H pluses on both sides. So there's three on this side, two on that side. That one will disappear. That one's going to give me a two. So we've got two H plus. We're okay with that. We can now write this down. So that means we would be going PB plus HSO4 minus plus PBO2 plus 2H plus, which then gives me 2, because we're going to add them together, plus 2H2O. You are welcome, grade 12, to add the H plus to the HSO4 minus, realizing it gives you sulfuric acid, and that's a very important acid in your batteries. But then you've got to make sure you can balance the equation after that and that you can add spectator ions in. So please, 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 please be very, very careful. And you know what? I wouldn't do it at all. I would leave it like this. And I think I've, act I've actually made a mistake. Let's just quickly look at this. Remember H plus H minus on both sides. So it's 2HSO4. Okay, go back and check. It's always very, very important. Okay, I forgot to add them together. This is balanced as it stands. Okay, don't go and get fancy and add a whole bunch of things to it. Remember, you have turned the equations around so your double arrows would disappear. The, the question would have had it with double arrows. You may not put double arrows in your final answer over here. Okay, you may not put double arrows there. It's not equilibrium. This is a one-way reaction it's only going to the right when it is discharging okay this is the discharging process when it's charging then we're reversing it okay but they didn't ask us about that this is the process of when it is making electricity it's making enough current for you to start your car remember it's only a, on for a very short period of time and it gives a huge current which is very very important okay Next question, calculate the EMF of the battery consisting of six cells. Okay, EMF, we can do this. 
we've realized we said this earlier that's my oxidation that's going to be my reduction so that's my anode that's my cathode why am i doing that you have three equations for working for writing out how to work out a emf so your e cell is equal to the emf of your cathode minus the emf of your anode or your electric potential on your information sheet it also gives it to you as the e the emf of the reduction minus the emf of the oxidation or the emf of the oxidizing agent minus the emf of the reducing agent any of those can do you may not abbreviate them okay you may not make them shorter so you can't go e cell equals e cat minus e n may not abbreviate okay so we know which one's my anode and my cathode that means i'm going to go one comma seven minus minus naught comma three six please be careful here because a lot of the times you go but i turned that top equation around i swapped it so surely that means the emf must be negative no it mustn't okay the emf cannot become must, mustn't change sign it must stay negative it was negative it stays negative do not change it okay the equation helps take that into account so when i add 1 comma 7 to 0 comma 36 because it becomes a positive number i get 2 comma 06 volts and now i'm hoping some of you are going oh come on tracy there's no ways that can be worth five marks you are correct it's not worth five marks at the moment each cell produces 2 comma 06 each battery has six cells that means the emf of the battery is going to be six times two comma oh six twelve comma three six volts be careful there it's a little bit of a trick okay each cell is two comma oh six and we just put and why do we multiply them together because they are in series we want to increase the voltage okay nice question that we could put in here if we were being particularly nasty but this question doesn't ask for it is why do we talk about a battery being 12 volts emf when it's actually we've just worked it out to be 12.36 remember we've got to we've got to account for internal resistance car batteries have very small internal resistance we need it to have a small internal resistance because if its internal resistance is too small, it cannot produce a big enough current to get the alternates and everything else going that needs to go for your car to move to get the, the motor going. Small internal resistance, that sort of uses up that extra above the 12 volts. Okay, next one. Now it says, oh, we don't like these ones. Calculate the maximum time that this battery will be able to say, supply a constant current of 5 amps to an appliance connected to it assuming the capacity of the battery remains the same now they told you the capacity was 20 amp hours capacity is q it's i times t now this is one of those hard things because you know it's times time time um, hours current times time but the 20 amp hours is q it's it's a way for us writing q but do we ever measure anything in hours so we know that we want to supply current of five amps we want to know what the time is they didn't say in hours in minutes in seconds so we could actually use the 20 as it stands okay and then realize that delta t gives me four hours okay four hours be careful here if you're going to use the 20 as it stands it means four hours we can convert it into amp seconds okay so now watch here if i convert it into amp seconds i'm still going to use q equals i delta t it's 20 amps times hours 
So now we remember, well, in one hour, there's 60 minutes, and in one minute, there's 60 seconds. So that means we've got to go 60 times 60. So here, we're going to go 20, and we're going to take the hours into seconds, which is 60 times 60. My current is 5. We get delta T, and now we get 14,400 seconds. We would divide by 60 to get it into minutes, divide by 60 again, and we will end up with four hours. Okay, so we're going to divide by 3,600. Either way is correct. What they were wanting to see there, grade 12s, is that you understood what the 20 amp hours means. That's what they were looking for. Okay, last question. State two, in, you're going to get environment somewhere, okay? two environmental risks associated with the irresponsible disposal of lead acid batteries. Well, lead acid batteries, first of all, have sulfuric acid in them. Sulfuric acid is extremely toxic, okay? And what happens is the acid contaminates our groundwater. So that's the first one. Our acid contam got to remember how to spell today, contaminates the groundwater. Okay, that's the first thing. Second thing, the lead is a heavy metal. When that leaches into our ground, okay, it's a heavy metal and it can destroy crops if it leaches into our grounds and our soil and all of that. It does lots of crop damage and it's bad for our soil. It destroys our plants. And then the other thing is the plastic. Okay, the plastic container is not, is not biodegradable. Okay. Now, I'm sure some of you are going, oh wait, hang on Tracy, that means it's a real problem to use batteries. No, it's not. Batteries are 90% recyclable. So if your parents' car battery goes, they really need to give it back to a battery place, one of the battery, you know, all the different battery fitness centers we have. They can recycle. It's 90% recyclable. And then whatever can't be recycled is disposed of responsibly. Okay. Now, grade 12s, we have done a lot of work today. We have run out of time, I'm afraid. The three sections that will be at the end of your chemistry paper, which I'm sure you will be fine with now. Make sure you learn all the little nuances and the ins and outs and practice, practice, practice. So, grade 12s, that is it from me, and I will see you again next time.